My gosh, what a glitchy start we've had today. I haven't even been talking the whole time. Ugh. I said everything, too. I did the whole opening spiel. Well, I'll say it again. It's 7.34. For the first time, I haven't been on time to say 7.30 p.m. CST. Say that, pretend that I did, though, for the sake of continuity. And welcome, all of you, to Cast Talks. And hello to you, Playful and Ginny. Yeah, it's all right. Oh, we've got some bots in chat. Let me get rid of them for you. There we go. So, let me tell you a little bit about what this show is. Cast Talks is a talk show where if you're feeling a little bit lonely or if you'd like to hang out or hear a comforting voice for a little while or just relax, hear some good news, see some good images, then you can show up and hang out with us for a few hours. You can talk and chat and I'll respond to you or you could even just lay in bed and fall asleep if you'd like to. On tonight's episode, we're talking about some really for life news. We're talking about some good news. And then we'll be going into a few stories I have written down right here. And that's all coming up tonight on Cast Dogs. I did, I didn't notice at first. I didn't notice it's true. I'm not sure if you prefer to be called Playful or Nicole. Which one do you prefer? I actually didn't recognize you because of your name. So, whatever you prefer, I'll call you that. It was your, uh, it was your profile image that actually made me realize who you were. I'll call you playful for now, just for the sake of continuity, which I've said twice now on this stream. But Ginny, playful, <laughs> how are you two doing? How is your week going? I'd like to hear about that if you're willing to share. And on top of that, how are you feeling this weekend? What is going through your mind? What are you thinking about? I'd love to hear it. Your week went okay. You think you're finally rested up. Well, go ahead. It can take some time to actually achieve a rest state. Jenny was the first one in beside you, which is awesome. All right. I did see that you were both here when I turned it on. Oh, but you know what? I'm having all sorts of goofs today. There we go. Jeez. Episode 34 is the, the goof stream. I didn't even have you guys on the screen yet. See, I had this media set up for the uh, for the goo the background goo you might have seen that one already it might have messed up my whole layout though but it's okay it was worth it it's very pretty it's very thematic as well for this show but either way just another week and we finally started opening up our restrictions well good yeah I know oops well not every cast talks is going to be as professional as I'd like it to be, but at least we're here, hanging out, enjoying our time together. So tell me about some of these restrictions that have opened up. What have you been allowed to do? You're going to turn your air down because it's hot up here. <laughs> I understand. It's been hot over here as well. <laughs> no, it's alright. Hey, sometimes these shows are a little bit glitchy, and sometimes they work out really well. 
and we never know which one it's going to be until the actual show starts and hopefully it'll pick up and we'll get plenty of, of action and things going on hopefully gatherings can finally go up to 10 outdoors well that's pretty great I think we have a no mask uh, indoors if you're vaccinated thing you can just go wherever you want if you're vaccinated but I don't know about gatherings I'm not sure about that but what I do know is that we are coming out of this we're, we're finally starting to see the other side maybe even come through the other side a little step by step yeah I don't think Jerry will be around he's at Relay for Life right now I think that he will appear eventually but I don't think he's going to be here to chat for the moment but uh, me and Lily, which is a clip I'll show you later we're hanging out and we did a full lap around the course which I was very happy about a full lap we got to hang out for a little while and I held her hand while mm -hmm. I held her hand while I we did the course and I it was great we had a great time and we made it all the way around I even got to donate some money And I'll show you guys some of the footage from that in just a little while. But to begin with, we're going to start with some good news. So here's a, a quick one. Welcome back, Jenny. You're just in time for some good news. weirdness of dreams may be why we have them says new theory of dreaming by good news network from june the 10th of 2021 you're quite welcome inspired by techniques used to train deep neural networks a neuroscience professor has argued for a new theory of dreams the overfitted brain hypothesis. The hypothesis from Eric Hole at Tufts University suggests that the strangeness of our dreams serves to help our brains better generalize our day-to-day -day experiences. There's obviously an incredible number of theories of why we dream, says Hole. But I wanted to bring to attention a theory of dreams that takes dreaming itself very seriously that says the experience of dreams is why you're dreaming a common problem when it comes to training ai is that it becomes too familiar with the data it's trained on it starts to assume that the training set is a perfect representation of anything it might encounter data scientists fix this by introducing some chaos into the data in one such regular regularization method called dropout some data is randomly ignored imagine if black boxes suddenly appeared on the internal screen of a self-driving car the car sees that random black boxes on the screen and focuses on overreaching details of its surroundings rather than the specifics of that particular driving experience will likely better understand the general experience of driving the original inspiration for deep neural networks was the brain, Hull says. And while comparing the brain to technology is not new, he explains that using deep neural networks to describe the overfitted brain hypothesis was a natural connection. If you look at the techniques that people use in regularization of deep learning, it's often the case that those techniques bear some striking similarities of dreams. 
he says. With that in mind, his new theory suggests that dreams happen to make our understanding of the world less simplistic and more well-rounded because our brains, like deep neural networks, also become too familiar with the training set of our everyday lives. Hull's theory is laid out in a review in the journal Patterns. To counteract the familiarity, he suggests, the brain creates a weirded version of the world in, in dreams, the mind's version of dropout. It's the very strangeness of dreams in their divergence from waking experience that gives them their biological function, he writes. Hull says that there's already evidence from neuroscience research to support the overfitted brain hypothesis. For example, it's been shown that the most reliable way to prompt dreams about something that happened in real life is to repetitively perform a novel task while you are awake. He argues that when you overtrain on a novel task, the condition of overfitting is triggered, and your brain attempts to then generalize for this task by creating dreams. But he believes that there's also research that could be done to determine whether this is really why we dream. He says that well-designed behavioral tests could differentiate between generalization and memorization and the effect of sleep deprivation on both. Another area he's interested to explore is one of the ideas of artificial dreams. He came up with overfitted brain hypothesis while thinking about the purpose of works of fiction like films or novels. Now, he hypothesizes that outside stimuli like novels or TV shows might act as dream substitutions, and that they could perhaps even be designed to help delay the cognitive effects of sleep deprivation by emphasizing their dream-like nature, for instance by virtual reality technology. While you can simply turn off learning in artificial neural networks, Hull says, you can't do that with a brain. Brains are always learning new things, and that's why they become overfitted. And it's where overfitted brain hypothesis comes in to help. Life is boring sometimes, he says. Dreams are there to keep you from becoming too fitted to the model of the world. I've never heard that before. I guess it kind of makes sense, though. You know, makes a little bit of sense. Here is another one. Endangered humpback whales gain new protections in Pacific Ocean from the U.S. by Good News Network from June the 10th. The U.S. administration has announced it will be officially protecting 116,098 square nautical miles of the Pacific Ocean as critical habitat for three populations of endangered humpback whales. The final rule could begin to help protect migrating whales from ship strikes, entanglement in fishing gear, and oil spills. The action was prompted by a 2018 legal victory by the Center for Biological Diversity. Wish Doyle Foundation and the Turtle Island Restoration Network, which sued over the federal failure to designate critical habitats as required by the Endangered Species Act. Pacific humpbacks finally got their habitats protected, and they've needed it for so long. We need to better protect humpbacks from ship strikes and entanglement in fishing gear, which is their leading causes of death said Catherine Killeff, an attorney with the center, in a statement. To recover West Coast populations of these playful, majestic whales, we need mandatory ship speed limits and conversion of California's deadly trap fisheries to ropeless gear. The Center for Biological Diversity also sued the federal government in January for failing to protect endangered whales from speeding ships using California ports. 
The organization is also co-sponsoring the California Whale Entanglement Prevention Act, which would require the state's commercial dungness, crab, and other trap fisheries to convert to ropeless gear, also known as on-demand or papa buoy gear, by the end of 2025. One population of endangered humpbacks that feeds off California coasts contains fewer than 800 individuals, leaving them vulnerable to threats from humans. This rule is a win, as it designates a total of 224,030 square nautical miles for the two endangered and one threatened populations. By overlapping habitat means 116,098 square nautical miles will be protected. Specifically, the rule designates 48,521 square nautical miles of critical habitat off the coast of California, Oregon, and Washington for the humpback population that winters in Central America. The Mexico population got 116,098 square nautical miles in the North Pacific Ocean, including Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska regions. That also made up the 59,000 square nautical miles listed for the Western North Pacific humpback population. Today is a good day for humpback whales and the ocean all living things depend on said Todd Steiner, Executive Director of Turtle Island Restoration Network. Designating 116,000 square miles of critical habitat in the ocean is something to celebrate, but whales, turtles, and dolphins still need attention, additional protection from industrial fishing and ship strikes to recover and thrive, so we won't be resting on our laurels. Critical habitat protection will help safeguard ocean areas essential for migrating and feeding. The designation will ensure that federally permitted activities do not destroy or harm important wildlife habitat or whale habitat. Evidence shows that endangered or threatened species that have protected critical habitats are twice as likely to be recovering as those without it. And that's good news, indeed. I like that one. So we're going to talk a little bit about Relay for Life. Relay for Life is a thing that happens in Second Life every year. This is the 2021 year of what is essentially a cancer research funding group, a funding charity organization that helps people with cancer and people studying cancer. In Relay for Life, you run around the relay track, and doing so promotes not only visibility on the issue, but it also generates a number of specific benefits from having the sim, which is basically a gigantic kiosk for donations, have more heat on it, more activity, meaning it becomes higher listed, it gains more people looking at it and seeing it, and generally, it's just helping to do anything about it. But I'm going to show just a little bit of footage from me and Distrata, specifically Lily, doing a little bit of circuiting around the Relay for Life track. Well, look who it is. It's Ella. Ella, Ella, Ella. Well, well, well. Well, come on in. Glad you could make it. Cass, Cass, Cass. It's true, that's my name. And here is me and Lily going through the, uh, the ribbon world. The Ribbon World, or the Rainbow World as it's called sometimes, is a 
a field of colorful knots and ribbons. And it's very pretty, very pretty with the sun setting in the background. I haven't known many people in my life that have had cancer, but one such person, who I won't say the name of, has been fighting with breast cancer for some time now. And she is a friend of mine that recently returned to Second Life. Not only has it been inspirational to see her journey, but it's also been very wonderful to know that she's hanging on despite being in pain and worrying and not having as much of a support network as she could use. But knowing that she's still trying and fighting despite all of that is a very powerful thing. And she is very clearly a driven, soldiering person. <laughs> yeah, Playful changed her name, which confused the, the heck out of me. I didn't know it was her, but... I, I figured it out, luckily. Luckily, it did happen. But yes, we're all here together. Yeah, I know, Ella. Oh. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I was I was the same way. And here is the beginning of the course. Me and Lily were walking on As down. To save lives, the themes of this lives, year were mostly the Wizard of Oz and cancer. King and Queen, uh, Prince and Princess style stuff. Tools you need to reduce your risk of cancer. Eating healthy, staying away from tobacco. And it was a lovely, lovely time. I basically I just used my walk alongside thing and attached myself to her movement and as soon as she started walking I started walking with her it was great and we had a very nice time I got to see the entire track which was also very nice and it is there's so much to do there's campsites there's lovely uh, people to talk to and there's just a smorgasbord of helpful things to let you know about cancer, about survivor stories, and about everything else going on. And if you would like to, you can go into the Relay for Life event just by searching and let me find the actual place for you in Second Life. It is a... actually you can probably see it on the screen. So I'll zoom in on it. It's called RFL Acceptance Premier Region Sponsor the Grave, the Grove. And if you'd like to go over there and hang out and uh, generally support these people, can you turn the sound from Second Life off? It's hard to understand you when you talk. It's on? It shouldn't be on. Oh, I see why it's on. Yeah, it's on. I didn't even realize you guys could hear that, but you totally can, can you? Ah, my bad. See, Ella, this is the goof stream. This is the stream that is totally just backwards, upside down. Yeah, I know, I know, playful. Oops. <sighs> Why did I record sound for that? <sighs> I didn't even know that it was recording sound. What a goof. What a goof. You could still hear me just vaguely. <laughs> it is a goof. We're getting goofed. Okay, this one shouldn't have any sound with it, though. But yeah, um, there is a lot of uh, good stuff happening every life for life. 
despite this goof stream, which, you know, there's always a goof stream every now and again. There is a lot of good stuff happening, and if you'd like to support them, then I believe they have a website you can go to. Let me check. You can go to the site and check out all the info that you'd like to. And it's a pretty darn good place to go and help out, help out with the cure for cancer, which who knows when that will be, but I hope it's soon. I do hope it's soon. Like everybody though, right? But yeah, I am more than I, I'm I'm joyed that I got to spend that time walking around the circuit. But I have a story for you folks. So much work goes into creating these sims. It's true. It's true. There's a lot of work that they do to make these they place so much small stuff down so much individual creation has been put into it to the point where i almost i don't i don't know how they do it they they do so much work and they do all this extra stuff and i suppose they have more usage of or more effort they can spend with their typing and clicking so they probably have that but I I can't imagine doing all that anymore. Look at all those bags with the names. Yeah, those are the little uh, candle candle bags, candle things. I'm not sure why they look that way, but you know, each one of them has a memoriam to a specific person or a specific cause. And they are there are two that I put a a in honor of and in memory of. One of them was to Dark Griffith, who was a very good friend of mine, who unfortunately was never able to see Cast Tonks, which is very sad. Then they take it all down and rebuild it for the next relay. I think there's a thing called a flood uh, flood uh the flood parade or something and that's when they take it all down and yeah next year they do it all over again it's all in the in the awesome race and awesome uh, name of charity and donation And it's a very good thing. They get a lot done and they do a lot with it. For certain though, it is uh, something I really enjoy is doing the walks around the sim, though I can only do a little bit. And I'm looking forward to the snail races, which I don't know when those happen, but I am going to look it up and try to get involved with those so I can get some footage of the snails because I love those snails. That's one of my favorite parts of the Relay for Life. Maybe my most favorite part. It's a great thing. So, something else that I'll tell you guys about is a little story that I remembered from when I was a child. So, when I was, uh, I'm going to say eight. Let's say eight. I was a, a climber, you could say. I was a mischievous parkour enthusiast. And I may have told this story once already, but I'll tell it again. So, I had this group that I had made, and it was a group 
of other parkour enthusiasts who banded together to climb things that we were not supposed to or meant to climb. This group was called the Black Dragon Ninja Club. It was an elementary school uh, gang, essentially, where we all tried to do things that uh, were a little risky, and we tried to climb and jump and uh, essentially... You could call it sort of a obstacle course of things we would do. And one of those things was we would climb places where we weren't supposed to be. Eventually, I led to me climbing the top of the building and sneaking around up there for a little while without being noticed, which uh, the teachers and the yard people, the, I'm not sure what you would call them, the people who were watching the kids during their recess, they do not like that. They really do not like that. And <laughs> I I was never caught for that, but I, I definitely would have gotten in trouble if I was. The, the thing I was caught for was I was climbing up the side of this bridge in the sandbox, the sandbox area. And there's this barred bridge with a bit of a tryptophobic flooring with lots of a holes on it. And there were these uh, younger, younger ladies about my age. And they were discussing something very serious. And I wanted to try and... And look, there was the, the people on their horses in the background. And... I, I was climbing uh, and I interrupted them and said hey there while I was just hanging off the side of the bridge and the recess I, the recess person saw this and they walked up and they're like okay you're going down and they grabbed me around the, around the ribs and stuff and they hoisted me down to the ground and they said you're going in the corner and so I had to sit against the wall and watch everybody else have fun for the rest of recess. <sighs> what a silly thing. It didn't stop me though. It didn't stop me from climbing things where I shouldn't have been climbing them. <sighs> I'm not sure why that story stuck out to me this week. But certainly the Relay for Life stuff. If you play Second Life and get involved, go and have a good time. Go and have a good day and go hang out over there with those good people. And I, I would like to get Jem on the show at some point, though I'm glad it wasn't for this stream because this has been a goof stream so far. <laughs> and she'll probably be less busy next week as well, so that'll be a good thing. But I am thinking that we are going to watch some good, some cat videos. Oh, oh, okay. What is the animal that we're watching this time? Does anyone have any specific interests? It is all right if not, but I'm definitely taking requests right now. Let's look at, let's take a look at RFL Second Life, actually. I want to see their Wikipedia page. Let's do this. What is Relay for Life? Oh, I'm asking what kind of animals you'd like to see in today's animal video segment. Relay for Life is the cats, you want cats, okay, is the American Cancer Society's signature fundraising event. All right. No more Relay for Life images just this second.
first video is called Clingy Cat Has to Be With Dad 24 7 from the Dodo Soulmates. You know, I'd love to have a clingy cat, but I've said that before. Reeling for Life offers a community to everyone and an opportunity to participate in the fight against cancer. Teams of people from all walks of life have fundraising, much needed funds to fight cancer and raise awareness for cancer prevention and treatment. Teams of people camp out at local high school park or fairgrounds to take turns walking or running around a track or path. Reeling for Life is the signature event of the American Cancer Society in Second Life and has been active and continually growing in Second Life since 2005. In 2005, the first Relay for Life of Second Life was attended by a few hundred avatars and raised almost 5,000 US dollars for the American Cancer Society. The 2014 RFL of Second Life event ranked number 17 out of 5,000 events worldwide in donations received. SL residents have brought in over 3.9 million US dollars to help with the fight against cancer since 2005. I love that. This stream is all over the place today. <laughs> man, oh man. June's Bork stream. The Bork stream of June. Oh, Ella, I meant to ask you, how are you doing? I didn't ask what I wanted to. Has your week been okay? Are you doing well? <laughs> Cat squats. Oh, that's adorable. The next one is called Woman Adopts. Oh no, Second Life started up accident. <laughs> Woman Adopts Grandparents Grumpy Cat. It's, it's a very cute cat. Is that a tabby cat? It's a very, it is a grumpy cat, I'll say that much. I'm glad you're enjoying it though, Jenny. Oh, you've seen it before, huh? Well, go ahead. Oh my gosh, the cat is giving the evil eyes. The very evil eyes. It's a calico. All right. A ball of anger and fire and love all at the same time. 
Oh my gosh. A floofy cat. Catwalks. Ah, uh, catwalks are great. But here are some frequently asked questions about Relay for Life, Second Life. Where can I go in world to receive information about Relay for Life or for cancer support? You can visit the American Cancer Society Island. What is Relay for Life? Take place overnight. The significance of daytime and nighttime coincides with the journey that all cancer patients go through. A much used slogan is, cancer doesn't sleep and neither do we. I like that. How does this relay differ from Relay for Life in real life? The main difference is location. Residents form teams, set up and decorate campsites, and sell small items to help raise money, just like at a local relay. Since this is a virtual environment, however, there are some activities that are special to Second Life, such as snail races and sailboat races. Oh, I love the snail races. <laughs> They're so good. Relay for Life is an activity of the American Cancer Society. Is it just for Americans? Relay for Life is international. In real life, Relay for Life is licensed to national cancer societies in 19 countries outside of the United States. The American Cancer Society's International Relay for Life program provides training and technical assistance to licensees in Second Life. Participation by residents from other countries is growing with avatars from over 80 real countries. The Bork stream continues. Cat who wouldn't show his face is a cuddle bug now. Oh, Ginny, how are Gilly and Reba doing? I forgot to ask you. Good home for a good cat. That's how it should be.
Oh wow, we're already almost halfway through. Yeah, this Borg stream is going by pretty quick. Oh. I think that I'm going to read a quick good news story before we go back, go on to our break. Let's do it. Alzheimer's patient asks wife to marry him after falling in love for a second time by Judy Cole. Love is wonderful the second time around but it can be all the more special if you don't remember the first time. For Peter Marshall, who suffers from early onset Alzheimer's, forgetting his past has meant a bittersweet chance to fall in love with his wife, Lisa, and ask her to marry him all over again. Peter and Lisa have been married for 12 years. At 56, his illness has progressed rapidly, but no matter what turn his condition takes, Lisa remains steadfastly by his side because even if he can't remember her name, he knows that he loves her and that she loves him. Let's put another one on. Let's go for a stray cat gives birth in a woman's bathroom. He doesn't know that I'm his wife. I'm just his favorite person, Lisa told NBC News for New York's Ida Siegel. I don't have, I don't need to have a label. I don't need a name because our hearts are connected. Last winter, as the Connecticut couple sat on the couch watching a television wedding, Peter had an inspiration. Not realizing they were already married, he proposed and surprised Lisa happily accepted. And so a date was set Vendors who knew Lisa's event planner daughter donated their services to make the per day perfect. Throughout the touching ceremony, Peter beamed at his bride, while sometimes, through tears, Lisa smiled back as she made her vows. It was so perfect, I couldn't have dreamt for a better day. It was magical, Lisa told NBC. I can't remember seeing him so happy for so long. I'm the luckiest girl in the world. I got to do it twice. Even the ceremony took place. Though the ceremony took place only a few months ago, Peter has no recollection of the event. But what he's not forgotten is the woman who's never going to leave him. The woman he loves, who loves him back. And when hearts are truly connected, sometimes remembering love can be more than enough. That's really sweet. <laughs> Ella, did you just get back? <laughs> I was just asking how your day went. You might have missed it, though. A pregnant cat is hanging out in this person's house. I think that's labor. <laughs> you went to the bathroom. It's okay. But how did your week go? Your day was fine, pretty laid back. Well, go ahead. What about me? I mowed the lawn, I went to the Relay for Life event, and I, look at those tiny little, look at those tiny, your week was tiring. You've been working more, I bet. Uh, yeah, that's your tiny little beans that just came out of their mom. Now she's cuddling them up close like she ought to. 
tiny little bean, little jelly beans with fur on them. But yeah, um, my day has been, has been a little uneventful. I woke up and exercised. I had my nice breakfast of veggie bacon and a uh, vegan pancake. And then I exercised a little more, rested my hands. And then I went to the Relay for Life event at about three with uh, Lili, and uh, Lili is probably still there. And then I, I rested some more and got in here and did this. I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. Your screen keeps freezing, you had to log out and, 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 and a few minutes ago, you had to leave at the break, so I think we'll go ahead and say goodnight. Well, goodnight to you, Ginny. And thank you so much for spending your time here. And I hope to see you again soon. I'm sorry we haven't talked as much as I would have liked us to this week. But we'll talk sometime really soon, okay? Yeah, good night to you. And... We are going to go into our break. Now what we do at the halfway point is we stand up and stretch out and take some time to just relax and make sure that we're not uh, sitting down or laying down too much. We get a drink of water and go to the bathroom and just take a moment to have a little walk about. And during that time, I'll be gone too. But I'll be back soon in about five minutes. So I'm gonna go get up and do that, and I suggest you do, do the same. So be right back.
we're back. Well, well, well. Looks like we're all back here, hopefully. And I hope you had a nice little break from whatever you were doing, laying down or just relaxing. But I am, I'm feeling a little exhausted myself, to be honest with you. I remember I was laying down just a little bit before the stream started and I was thinking, man, when this stream is done, I'm gonna lie down again and just go to sleep. That's what I'm going to do. Because I've been uh, out there in the yard mowing the lawn. I forgot to mention I mowed the lawn today. And I did goof at the beginning. Oh, Ella. I did spend a little bit of time working on the break screen. The break screen and the opening scene are the two things I've added to the stream just recently. You don't think either of you, of you moved? <laughs> well, that's all right. Totally all right. But yeah, I added those and I'm really happy with the way they turned out. I had to crop a lot of stuff to make it work, but it ended up looking pretty good if I say so myself. I, I really like the abstract nature of those images. You can't wait to see the started screen next stream. Well, <laughs> I'm glad that you're so excited about it. It's basically the same thing, but with a with a different text over it. But you know, it's it's very pretty. It's very very pretty. Playful's right. It's today is a goof stream. It's a bork stream. A dingus stream, even. And I was hoping to get a gem star killer on at some point this week, but not only is she busy, but I'm glad she didn't come onto this stream because it is a goof stream. It's definitely a bork stream. We're going to read some more good news. <laughs> A goof stream ain't nothing wrong. Well, I'm glad that you think so. Ain't nothing wrong with the goof stream. So here's some more good news. 95 year old widowers who found love in the time of COVID get married by Good News Network on June the 9th. With social distancing and limited face-to-face -face interaction, dating in the time of coronavirus has proved a challenge for everyone. But when Cupid's dart struck one spirited pair of non agenarians they refused to say no to love. When John Schultz, a widower twice over, met jo Joy Morrow Knowlton, who'd also lost two previous spouses, he knew he was smitten, and the feeling was mutual. Unfortunately, it seemed as if the pandemic was conspiring to keep the would-be lovers apart. 
while it took some doing. The upstate New York couple continued to pursue their mutual attraction despite COVID-19's shelter-in-place protocols. She was worth it. It was a pain in the neck, though, John quipped to CBS's Steve Hartman during a segment of On the Road. Eventually, after receiving their vaccinations and with restrictions lifting, the pair was finally able to get back to the business of courtship. The more time they spent together, the stronger their bond grew until John, being an old-fashioned gentleman, finally proposed. Joy accepted. When the couple wed in a recent ceremony, both the bride and groom were 95. Senator Michelle Hinchy said, At a time when we've never felt more isolated from one another, two 94-year-old Ulster County residents, John Schultz and Joy Morrow Knowlton, did something unexpected. They fell in love. On Friday, we had the honor of accompanying John and Joy for a very special outing to the Kingston POD site where they received their final dose of the COVID vaccine and where I had the opportunity to present them with a Senate certificate in recognition of this momentous occasion. Joy, a former Rondout CSD school teacher, and John, a businessman and former president of Canfield Supply in Kingston, remind us how important it is to lead with love during challenging times. We're grateful to John and Joy, who recently got engaged, as well as John's wonderful family, Emily, Claire, and Barb, for allowing us to share this amazing milestone with them. In traditional romance sagas, the hunky hero and the spunky heroine must face a gauntlet of obstacles before finally arriving at their happy ending. For John and Joy, it didn't take being young or hunky to find true love, but being spunky sure paid off. When asked what, their, what was the key to his dad and new stepmom's successful romance, Schultz's son Pete had a ready answer. Perseverance, he told Hartman. They'd call every day. They'd find a way to get together. They did whatever it took. Hunky and spunky, huh? Yeah, I know what you mean, Ella. I know what you mean. Proving that if you have the courage to follow your heart, you're never too old to say, I do. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good one. I hope it doesn't take until I'm 95 to meet my special someone. But, you know, if it takes that long, it takes that long. What can I say? Hopefully, when I get... Oh, I, I sent out a resume to a local dispensary. And the inside smelled pretty skunky. But, you know, I have realized that I actually smell skunky whenever I start to sweat. Or whenever I exercise and stuff like that. Which is a little... Uh, not embarrassing, but it makes me feel a little self-conscious that I smell like dank weed whenever I get, like, whenever I exercise or whenever I uh, get too hot. <laughs> and I don't know how to feel about that. It's certainly an interesting time to be me, to learn things like this. It's very strange. I guess there's worse things you could smell like. Sweat is just a stinky smell, don't worry. Well, thank you for saying that. It is pretty stinky, I have to say. It's pretty stinky. I'm sure someone out there would be more than happy to smell my skunk scent. Just like I'll be happy to smell theirs. So here's another good news. New shipping material made from popcorn can replace styrofoam peanuts by Andy Corbley from June the 9th of 2021. In a stroke of scientific genius, a German researcher enjoying a box of popcorn in a dark movie theater realized that the overpriced butter soaked concession had the exact same size and consistency as styrofoam packing peanuts. Considering styrofoam is made from polystyrene, 
which requires fossil fuel extraction and takes centuries to break down into yet smaller bits of harmful microplastic. Other is I, Carizabor. That was a good one. Thought it was worth experimenting with puffed corn kernels as a replacement for them. Annually, in the U.S. alone, around 3 million tons of polystyrene is produced, which is a lot considering it's 95% air. It's a popular choice because it has enabled packaging to take on very precise forms and provides excellent package packing safety. God, there's a gnat in my room. Ah, get out of here. For fragile electronics on the move, for instance, while costing pennies to manufacture. One of the worst qualities is that most recycling fa facilities don't have the capability to process it. <laughs> Hey, stale popcorn is actually pretty good. I definitely wouldn't mind getting popcorn with my package, even if it does get stale. If you could just eat these, I mean, if you could just eat them, I mean, it's not so bad, right? It's not so bad. Though I probably wouldn't recommend eating something that's been like that, but... I, I'm fine with stale popcorn, as long as there's butter on it. Oh, I can't even eat butter anymore, never mind. <laughs> what a kill sport. Kill, spoil sport. But alright. I I would still like like vegetarian butter or whatever. That'd be good. Though it's not as good as uh dairy butter, of course. Our popcorn packaging is a great sustainable alternative to polystyrene, which is derived from petroleum, said Stefan Schult, managing director of Nord Nordgetrade. The products are very light because popcorn granules are filled with air like honeycombs. Karazipur tells Fast Company, when grain maize expands into popcorn, the volume increases by 15% to 20%. Taking corn waste products produced from making cornflakes then filling them with steam creates the Karazipur, what Karazipur and his team at Göningen University call granulated popcorn. The popcorn packing can be made from any type of corn and is completely biodegradable. Large pieces can be compressed into shapes to hold different products and can be easily sawed into pieces, either for cutting into precise shapes or for shredding at the end of its life. The brilliance of Krasipur's idea has landed him an exclusive licensing agreement with a medium-sized grain and cereal company in Europe called Nordkotende for manufacturing various popcorn packing products. I am really proud of myself for saying Nordkotrade so well. I am just winging it and it sounds really good. So I'm happy with that. I'm real happy with it. Because I have no idea how that's actually pronounced to be honest with you. That's a good one. It was a very good one. Oh, here's another good one. Okay. Five experiments proving invertebrates are much smarter and more aware than we think. By Andy Corbley from June the 8th of this year. Swat a fly, who cares? It's not like they have feelings. Or do they? Jonathan Balcombe is an English ethnologist, a studier of animal behavior, and has published several books on the subject, the most recent of which was called Superfly, the Unexpected Lives of the World's Most Successful Insects. In it, he begins to try and unravel our natural-born prejudice towards anything with more than two legs, and shows that many of the most well-established intelligence tests we use for mammals and birds can also be passed by bugs and cephalopods. In a literary hub excerpt, he argues that this should at least leave us revisiting whether these tests prove intelligence as such, or if we need to re-examine the concept of animal intelligence at large. Let's take a look at how intelligent invertebrates are. Bees are known to have a mind-bogglingly complex sensory interconnectivity through the use of pheromones that allow them to seemingly move as if controlled by a single mind. 
and yet individual bees can recognize individual human faces and understand concepts of something same and something different, which was demonstrated in tests with shapes and colors. Honeybees seem to know seem to know they know things as well. One cited study suggested bees would not participate in tests that were very difficult if failure meant receiving a bitter tasting liquid at the end. Researchers took this to mean the bee would only participate in tasks it knew it was capable of finishing. Wow, that's crazy. There's a part about spiders coming up that I don't like already. Wasps. Low on the stingometer, paper wasps score high on other tests, such as their ability to recognize individual members above their colony by the distinct marks on their little heads. By digitally altering features of a colony member's face, researchers were able to observe that they would choose their comrade's face over the doctored image. Tool use, a generally accepted form of higher intelligence, is found in digger wasps, who often paralyze their prey buried underground and use flat stones to tamp down the dirt they moved in order to disguise it from other insects that have learned an easy meal lies within the burrow. I did not know that. One of the distinguishing features here is that they selected flat stones in particular and not any such hard object, such as a nut that might have been lying around. Okay. Ants can recognize themselves in a mirror. We're not kidding. In what Balcombe describes as his favorite insect intelligence test, Brussels researchers found ants behave differently when looking at their own face in a mirror than colony mates viewed through a pane of glass. This MSR test was the same one that caused a scientific revelation and re-evaluation in the, in the 70s when chimpanzees were found to do the same. When the blue dot was applied to their forehead, the ants upon seeing themselves in the mirror and like so many humans before going on public, busily scrubbed away until the pesky sting was removed. This preening wasn't observed if the blue dot was placed on the back of their head where they couldn't see it, or if it was applied and they were not given a mirror to gaze into. Since 1970, just apes, dolphins, elephants, magpies, and as Balcom points out, a type of cleaner fish have passed this test. Octopuses. This animal has garnered a lot of attention recently with a string of now iconic videos on YouTube, as well as several experts talking about the electric minds of America's, big, of America's biggest broadcaster. An octopus can open the childproof containers and untie knots. It's a master of escape, has emotion, and demonstrates play behavior. They even have a unique personalities and can actually learn skills by watching others. This has led the researchers to suggest that given the evolutionary distance between mammals and octopuses, consciousness was first developed by the eight-legged curiosities and that therefore consciousness has evolved on Earth on two separate occasions at least. Huh. Spiders. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to this part. We save the species for last so that arachnophobes who may not enjoy hearing that spiders are more intelligent than we thought can leave having enjoyed the rest of the article. You know what? That's what I'll do. Good story. It's over. <laughs> Very good. Glad that I read that. Let's get another one in here. These homegrown mushroom hives could save Ireland's bees by Andy Corbley from June the 7th of 2021. An Irish designer is hoping to save her island's native bee species by creating special hives grown from mushrooms. Placing on the world top 20 for the James Dyson Design Award for Sustainability. 
Harry Magellan. The prototype hive called Econoc is being designated specifically by name Demery for the Irish black bee, as well as to get more people involved in conversation and conservation. Plummeting bee populations in Ireland are not only the result of habitat loss or pesticide use, as is common elsewhere, but also because for years the country imported bee populations from warmer climates that have a hard time surviving the Irish winter. Those introduced species bred with native bees to create hybrids that invaded black bee hives, but that still couldn't cope with the weather. Econoc hives are grown from mycelium spores, spread onto an agricultural byproduct, like wood shavings or straw, called a substrate. Mycelium is the fibrous underground structure that supports the fruiting body, the mushrooms we see on logs, and is emerging as a potential super design tool. GNN has reported on its use to make things as varied as bricks, canoes, and even coffins. The mixture of mycelium and substrate is stuffed into a mold to mimic the natural structure of a beehive before going in the oven to preserve the shape. Ikunuk simulates the hollow of a native tree where black bees tend to build their hives in order to shelter themselves, their food, and their young from the rain. A landing pad where owners can watch bee activity in and out of the hive is made from recycled plastics, while the straps that secure it to the tree are old car seat belts, making it almost entirely recycled or otherwise sustainable. Damery also worked to create a calendar which will be included in the purchase of every hive that each month educates the owner on the different native plants growing in that period that require Irish black bees for pollination, as well as what exactly is happening inside the hive during that season. In addition, once the month is finished, the owner can rip the calendar's bottom part off, which is filled with wildflower seeds and place it under an inch of soil in their garden to further aid in the efforts to save black bees and other Irish pollinators. As soon as Ikanook is ready for market, we'll be sure to let you know. Oh, lovely. So I want to look at more of that awesome footage of the Second Life Relay for Life stuff. Welcome back, Eli. Did you get to see any of the footage already that we had from Relay for Life? You did. Well, good. I'm showing a little bit more of it right now. Me and, uh, and Lily got to do a little bit of walking for a little while. And we had a really great time. my efforts to improve the Relay for Life, you know, to give people money and to support cancer research. I hope that goes a long way. I generally have a lot of goodwill towards these I, charities. I really feel like they do a lot of good, and I feel like it's really great to have them and that they exist as a, a go-between for people who want to help and people who desperately need help.
and I'm really into it. I really am. <laughs> you know, uh, this goof episode, it may end up being a, a hour and a half long episode as well. Because I'm actually pretty tired. Which we haven't done in all of June, which I feel grateful that I've had enough energy in June to do stuff like that. But I, I am pretty sleepy. Maybe it's the tea calling me to bed. Yeah, let's make this a uh, let's make this uh, hour and a half stream. If you need some sleep, get some sleeps. Well, thank you. I'm always glad to have your advice, Helen. So, that's going to be it for us today. We've come to the end of our time. And I want to thank everyone who's been active in chat. Playful, Jenny, Ella. And I also want to say I am very grateful to be here and to be doing this for you guys. It is a wonderful thing, what we do. And I hope that you'll all... It was a good goof stream. Well, it's good. I'm glad that you're here, Ella, and I hope that we can come back next week and maybe have less of a goof stream, because the dingus stream, oh, it does stress me a little bit, but I can make it through. Either way, as always, you guys have a, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves, and make sure that you have a good night. You get to sleep okay, you stay safe. And you take care. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Stay classy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I hope that we all stay classy after hearing that one. Stay classy. You know, I know what you meant. But still. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty good. I like that one.